Carlos. Uh, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, that's really sad that our talk before this recording <laughs> miss it, will be missed from recording because I see it, it's logically connected. Uh, so I will try to refresh a little bit. So and let, let's start from introduction. Yes. Yeah, so my name is Nikolai Rizhikov. I understand it's hard to pronounce the last name. Uh, uh, on most of media like GitHub, Twitter, and other stuff, you can find me by this uh, nickname. I'm a, a co-founder and CTO of a uh, health samurai company. And today we're gonna talk about how to build configurable system of reusable components. Yes, this is a dream of programmers, yes, all architects, <laughs> and all people who spent more than five years in the program. Yeah, just a little bit about the health samurai. So we are building a, a platform for future healthcare applications on top of uh, Postgres uh, using the modern uh, rising uh, standard to exchange health data, which is called HL7 Fire. They're very nice community behind. So, and we are helping to drive this new standard, which will change the healthcare in the near future. Uh, we have like 35 holistic engineers. Most of them are full stack, closure, Postgres, Kubernetes. And I call it holistic because they participate in every aspect of development. So we are quite lazy and busy. We have a lot of open source, our company and me. Uh, it, it's not uh, very well documented, but there is a lot of interesting stuff. So please visit our uh, GitHub organization and see maybe you will find something interesting. So, okay, so now my personal story. So I. In my past life, I'm uh, radio. Uh, I am PhD in radio chemistry, in radio pharmacy. So I developed this nice uh, molecule, <laughs> which is called fluorine eighteen flumazine. It's used for uh, positron emission tomography diagnostic of epilepsy. So okay, then uh, do, so because I was working with radioactive compounds, so I started automating the production, and I started programming initially in Visual Basic, and then I decided to switch pivot to the programming. It was like 20 years ago, but I was uh, like 25 at the time. So with academic background, so I started, yeah, I, I came at the moment when the uh, UML was in rise, the Java was young, the .NET just appeared, yes. Then amazing stuff like Springs happens, Eclipse were open source, yes, JavaScript was very small. So I predicted at the time that there will be programmers on JavaScript. So everybody were laughing, but I said, you will see in a few years, there will be vacancy <laughs> on JavaScript and now it's here. Yeah, like more than 15 years ago. So I, let's say, get back to health tech. So we started writing cloud electronic health record for a few California hospitals. We started doing this in Ruby on Rails, which is a very uh, amazing framework. It's influenced not only me, I think it's influenced the whole industry. So we see GitHub, we know the test-driven development generators, I don't know. This practice uh, practices from Ruby on Rails now spread over the everything, but at that time we were quite lucky to use all this stuff. As well, I become a friend of Postgres, so we were using Postgres a lot and uh, my pleasure that I know some core contributors to the Postgres and I'm part of Postgres community as well. So, And like about eight years ago, we decided, yeah, we are smart enough to start building uh, the platform. <laughs> it's a platform so people can build the uh, health care application on top of it without spending many years like we do uh, uh, doing it wrong. So it's called it 8box. It's written completely in Clojure. It, the heart of this platform is still Postgres, and we were first users of binary JSON, uh, which were developed by my friends in Postgres and still using it. Yes. Okay, so that's intro about myself. And okay, let's get back to the topic. Yeah. So the logic line, how to build this system. So yeah, we built like a few million lines of uh, electronic health record and Ruby, yes. Now we're building this platform and yeah, it's a still challenge how to 
make the configurable system of reusable components and uh, grow the system large, uh, still feeling the control over system, yes. And I think this problem is still not yet solved. So here is a logical line how it's kind of, we speed up the history of uh, my, my reflection. So initially we just write naive code, yes. We want to create some, let's say some entity. So we write the code which create this entity, we write the code which validate this entity, which do some hooks after that. Then we uh, see uh, that eventually we notice that the same information is used in different uh, pieces of the code. So we start thinking how we can reuse this information. So write it only once, yes? So in Ruby on Rails, it was dry principle. Uh, don't repeat yourself, yes? In, in early Java and most of stuff, you repeat it yourself every time, <laughs> multiple times, yes? So then people uh, thinking how to reuse this. Some of them thinking, okay, so we have a class definition with some annotations, yes? Let's use this as a source of truth. So we can read this class definition with annotation and generate, let's say, tables for that and documentation and something like this. Yeah, or Ruby on Rails said, okay, let, let's uh, have a database schema as a source of true. Let's read this metadata from database and generate on fly uh, objects and classes. And that was quite nice. And But when you're thinking about this a lot, you understand that all of this information is, is just a data. So it it's just a data which may be represented in very inconvenient form like annotations and classes. Yeah, where it uh, belongs to some specific technology and hard to get off the, the specific stack. Uh, but yeah, but then you understand it, it's just a data. So, and if you have this data, so then you can write the more generic code. So you can write generic validation, which consumes this let's say model or configuration, what entity, what attributes, what rules should be. You can write generic uh, CRUD operation, you can write, write generic search operation, yes. I think everybody go through these steps with uh, some variations. Uh, and then, yeah, so we can program generic. So we can reduce the code base when we start programming generic way. So I think that object-oriented resist to write generic code. And that's very nice that functional programming, uh, especially closure, enforce you to write generic code. So you write less code. Uh, and then, yeah, you, you start splitting this code into this model definition or configuration and bunch of interpretators. And what's very nice, if you separate your model, uh, it can be used by many different interpreters. So if, if you have a class that's good, it, it, it will be used by Java, let's say, and may be used by some reflection to create a table, yes? But if you have some data, uh, they're crossing the technology border and you can imagine different applications, uh, different interpretation of this data. Let's say you can generate schemas, you can generate docs, you can generate validations, you can generate you can generate SDK for your API, you can generate everything, yes? Or you can interpret it. So, and that's really nice. Yeah. And the uh, closure force us to think about this because we, uh, we like to extract some uh, repeatable patterns into data and create what I call data DSL. Yes, like for routing, for, I don't know, for even SQL, right, in SQL, like workflow definition, uh, state machine definition. So we like to write HTML is written in data, yes, and closure, so everything. So then I uh, decided why the whole system could not look like we have a models and we have interpreters. So, and models written in data. So this is a very simple idea, yes. And uh, most of closure programmers do this uh, at, some, uh, at some degree, yes, but this data usually spread over the code. Yeah, you see this route as definitions, you see schemas definitions as a data. And the, why not just put this model outside? That was the original idea behind the then lang. Uh, let's just put all the metadata uh, separate and imagine the whole system as a bunch of interpreters 
and the graph of the models. Okay, so that's the intro. And now let's jump to the, maybe you have some questions at that point. Okay, so let's jump to the REPL. Uh, and let's follow the logic behind uh, then link. So the first of all, then link is just a metadata storage. So the first brilliant idea, we initially tried to uh, store metadata in JSON in Postgres, for example, or in YAML in files. And then we decided why not to use Eden, which is nice. And then we found very nice, uh, nice data type in Eden, which is called symbol. And symbol is used by Clojure to name things, yes? So the things can get the names, like functions of your other stuff. And why not use the symbols in Eden to name things? So, and then let's say, and then simulate the whole Clojure or Java program uh, project layout, but with the data. So let's say we have then a folder and every file in this folder is a namespace like enclosure. And if we jump into this namespace, yeah, we see that like name, it's just a map. And uh, the key is a name of this model or metadata. And then some data structure, uh, which is a content of this model. Okay, so let's try to do this from REPL. So uh, this is a small library, Zen is very small. So you just attach this library, you create the new context, which is essentially just an empty atom. atom. And then let's say we read namespace with the metadata. So it go to the file system and looking in a pass, the metadata.eden into the memory. And then we have very simple uh, function, which is uh, get the model by name. And name is fully qualified. Yes, so it's like enclosure namespace plus uh, the key in this map. Yeah, so we can, let me execute. Yeah, we got this model in, uh, in, in our closure. So this is a, one of the main functions of ZenLang, just get the model by name. Okay, so then because we introduced the names, now we can reference one model from another model with just a symbol with this name. So here we use kind of closure convention that the local names can be referenced without a namespace prefix. So I say I have model two, which refers model one. And if I jump to the, uh, to the REPL, so I can read the model two. Let's see. And because I have this nice uh, function, get, uh, get model by name, get symbol. So I can resolve this reference from model two to model one. Yeah, that's very easy, yeah? So, okay, let's follow the, the, the analogy with the closure. So we could put, we can put something in a separate namespace in a separate fi file. And we can reference, we can import this namespace into our namespace and then reference the symbol or model from different namespace. Okay, very simple. So what uh, ZenLang provide us, so when we reading this namespace, it's looking for the import section and reading other namespaces which are referenced by import section as well. Again, like closure and require. So we can read this M3 and let's see, and we see it reference uh, a fully qualified model from different namespace. And we can again resolve this reference. So very easy, yeah? Okay, so, and uh, let's break something. Uh, let's, for example, reference an existing, uh, an existing model, yeah? So this name doesn't exist in any namespace is a key. Yeah, so, and then Lang just easily uh, check that the reference exists. It 
doesn't fail, but it collects errors. So when we will try to read, I think it's model four, yes. So let's try to read model four. No, let, let's see errors. Yeah. So it collects an errors when loading namespaces. If some link could not be resolved, it, it just save this error. So you can react on this. So you can uh, uh, kind of build some linter using this stuff, which is check that all the references are exist. So what we have now, so we can kind of lay out all this metadata on the file system and they can be loaded into the memory, building the graph of data with the cross references. And so this is very simple stuff, but now you can put most of your uh, data DSLs, data configuration using this uh, uh, approach. And your program always can read using this simple operations, all, the, all of this metadata, yes? Uh, okay, so let's introduce the tag system in the then link. So we think that some models are of the same type, yes? Uh, I decided not to build the type system in a then link. So we just introduced the text. Every model can be labeled with a multiple text using this key like Zen text. And uh, here we just define that the table is a tag. So we say that the table is a Zen tag. And then we, for example, label, let's say we model the tables, yeah, or storages or something like this. So then we create the user storage and then we create the patient storage and we tag all of this with a table. So then Lang support multiple text so you can label it in a different ways and okay quite transform uh quite uh straightforward we have an operation uh, which says uh, give me all the all the models which are labeled with this tag and again you can you can go uh you can use get symbol operation to resolve all of these models yes here i got the list of all my table definitions and for example, my code just can get all this stuff and generate and create tables here yeah, or generate SQL migration to create these tables. So very simple, uh, but quite powerful. So now you can uh, scan your uh, meta base using text. Give me all the schemas, give me all the routers, and give me something and start building some interpreters, some smart interpreters. Okay, so that's the basic of then link, and the then link has internal schema, which is kind of extension of then link. It's a data DSL which describes the shape of data. Uh, so, um, okay, so this is helper functions. This schema is very influenced by uh, design of JSON schema. So maybe some of you are familiar with the JSON schema. It was designed by academic guys. Quite clear design how you can describe the validation rules uh, with the data structure. Yeah, the spec is nice, but spec is belongs to the code. Yes, yeah? so it's not natively data. So the uh, so and uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we just recreated then uh, JSON schema fixing some corner cases of JSON schema if the JSON schema were written for Eden. So let's say, uh, so each schema is a map with a set of instructions. So each key is a, is a rule which are checking uh, the instance. So, and here, for example, we can say that uh, the data should be a map. So in JSON schema, you will have type object. Yes, here we have types and map. So if we try to check, let's say, integer it will say that it's not of the type we are expecting or or we can check integer like this so if it's a map so we can describe the keys let's say we have a map uh, with the key a which can be type of any and this key is required and let's run this validation okay so now we validated that it works yeah. or 
with no errors and everything is okay. So uh, then schema has a built-in types. So here is a list, it mostly follow uh, closure hidden data types uh, plus some extensions. And uh, every type, uh, when you uh, set specific type instruction like type something, you enable specific rules. For example, if you turn on the map, you will have the rules require, you will have the rules keys and bunch of other rules and then is extensible so you can create your own rules, my own rule, something like this. Yeah, if you said the type is a string that you enable, uh, let's say special rule, which checks the mean and man, uh, max length of the string. Yeah, so let's save this schema so we can, uh, yeah, this uh, as well, it's coming with a, so this Zen schema described by themselves as a Zen schema. So you can always validate that you wrote the valid schema. Okay, so here we, for example, check the string as well. Uh, because it's self-described, so you can always look up in Zen schema what rules are enabled for what data types. So this is a root name, which it will be expressed as a key in a schema. And this is a data types, uh, types, Zen types, uh, which will enable this rule. If you will try, for example, uh, let's say for uh, set the rule mean length for integer. So it will not pass the uh, well self-validation because yeah, there is no rule mean length for integer. So this is just a fixing of JSON schema problems. And we tried not to, that rules are not dependent a lot of each other. So it's quite easy to add the new rules and it's quite consistent. The behavior is quite consistent. So, okay, now let's let's get back. So we have a, a meta store uh, where we can store different models and retrieve these models and walk through this graph. And what would be nice if all these models will be validated by some schemas. So when the users are writing instances of your models, you can create the schema so that then we'll be able to check that all these models are valid. So and now let's say we want to describe that, that we, we have a model which is called a table and it has a columns and columns is a map. And uh, in this map, all the values are maps and they have, uh, should have key type and this key should be of type string. Yes, so we can build this schema. We can validate the schema is right. And now we can validate the instance of the schema, which is a model, yeah? So if it will try to make some typo, we will see errors if we will. Yeah. So it's validating. And uh, I'm running this in REPL, but all of this uh, will live in files, yes? And then we'll auto check it. So that means that you can, using Zen, you can describe your own data DSL using the same tools and then start writing instances of this DSL. Yeah, so let's say, let's go even farther. So let's build this DSL to describe table. So we introduce a type tag. We say that our database has string and JSON B types. We describe the table. Uh, schema, which say it should be map, blah, blah, blah. And here we replace the type, not with a string, but the, with the send symbol, which is a link. And we say that uh, this symbol should reference the model, which is tagged with a type. And now we have even more uh, uh, checks. So let's say if we put here something unexisting, so it will, uh, say that wrong. If we put, let's say, the reference to the wrong model, it will complain that it's expected that the reference from type sh should be tagged with a type, but it's not tagged. So, so this is kind of you. You can describe your own DSL. You can get all the validation without doing almost anything. Yes. So and using the same tooling. Okay, so another difference uh, from JSON schema that uh, 
we were trying to design then to be at least a design time to be open world. That means if you described like one schema, so then you can, let's say, inherit from this schema and add the new keys, for example, to the map. So it, it's not closed. So, and that's why you can, you can always validate the model with the multiple schemas. So we can create the schema resource, which is, has attribute ID, and we can create the, let's say, model user. And we can validate uh, uh, this map with a resource schema. And if we try to validate the, uh, the map with a name attribute, just with the resource schema, it will say that it doesn't know the attribute name. And uh, uh, vice versa, if we validate this map with map with a name key by user, it will be valid. But if you validate it with the ID, it will say, I don't know what is the ID. So for because in user space, people still prefer to be closed. So that then provide the ability to validate uh, with the multiple schemas. But you see no errors here because they kind of working together. If at least one schema recognize the key in a map, everything is okay. So it, it opened for us ability to mix in the schemas, to compose uh, one schema from another scheme. Yeah, but it's still, if you introduce the key, which is not known by any of the schemas, you will get an error. Okay, and in then you can uh, yeah you can combine this. Uh, let's say we have three schemas resource, and let's add the status schema, and you can kind of mix in into the uh, final schema all these three schemas with the rule which is called it confirms. So now, if you validate it with the user, you see everything is valid, and only status is checked that it should be in. Enum, so if we fix it, so everything is good. So now, okay, so let's uh, get to the summary. So you can uh, store your models on the file systems. Uh, you can load it, this as a graph into the memory, and you could add some additional validation of your models using Zen schema. So, so we kind of getting very nice configuration framework where you could put all of your metadata and then use this metadata for interpretation or for uh, docs generation or for SDK generation, yes? So, so we did the next step. So why not to create the packages? Yeah, in Clojure we have libraries <laughs> so we can distribute all this stuff as libraries. So here we have just data, even no behavior. So it's easy to distribute as, as a libraries. So, and using Git, we created very simple uh, dependency management. So uh, if you have, uh, let's say, repo with a ZRC folder, and there are some models, let's say there's some, some kind of Kubernetes resources are described here. So you can, uh, store a uh, reference to dependency in a special Eden file. And we provide you with a function which can load all these dependencies recursively. So if these dependencies has other dependencies and all this stuff, they will be loaded and stored in, uh, in this special directory. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, and using the simple trick with a pass, so then we'll look up the model in your uh, user space, like uh, like SRC folder or in a in a uh, library folder. So I think it, it's quite straightforward. Yes. Yeah? So that's how you can publish your models, and that's very interesting because uh, I, I already said that the even JSON schema, GraphQL, and even guys who are working using protobuf definitions they didn't provide ability to create the libraries because all of these names, uh, they have a models, but names are local. So th they uh, forget to introduce the namespaces. <laughs> right after you introduce namespaces and names, we follow 
the rich hickey yes the the, the truth <laughs> talks so after then we introduce we can create the libraries with the models and these libraries can be distributed and reused so you can attach the library and get all this metadata with this library and optionally you can attach uh, let's say jar or something like this with interpreter which can interpret this model yeah so and that's how you uh, we're getting closer to this idea to separate the models from interpreters and now the models are completely reusable we have some cases when like these models are read by python code for example and something generated yes or some swift stuff is generated for me yeah so okay yeah so let's imagine that the whole kube and we we to be honest did this so we can the kubernetes is distributed as a json schema and we have a converter from json schema to zen schema and potentially you can distribute the Kuber, uh, Kubernetes uh, resources definitions as, as a Zen schemas, and then you can start writing some of your Kub Kubernetes stuff uh, in a namespaces like meta models. Yeah, Kubernetes is nice data driven platform, so it's close to the model driven platform. Um, yeah, I'm not going to execute this code, but and for example, we are working in in a standard spec so let me show you the standard yes why why we bother about all of these models so so that's the standard it has multiple versions and it's defined the data model for healthcare and you see this is like hundreds of models and let's find something like patient so and here is a patient model and this is quite deeply nested uh let's say json like structure and making all of this manually, yeah, it, it's crazy. It has a multiple version. It has a idea. I mean, in Fire, you can extend these resources and create packages. And so it's it's a hundreds and hundreds quite difficult models, which not only used for the validation but for other stuff as well, like searches. And so that's and for example, we generated the modules. Uh, for uh, the model uh, modules for all popular uh, metadata in our space and we have a converter from fire metadata to zen and and then is good uh, so fire just distributed as a bunch of json files without uh, structure and uh, reference checking and and then has this nice feature okay uh there are a few interesting other stuff like so you can create effects so let's say you want to validate the unique uh, stuff so it could not be validated in a pure fashion so when we borrow this idea from uh reframe so you can define the uh effect here is a tag it with a schema effect uh so this is a only one is a model yes and then when in your schema you will use this effect so uh, let me show how it will work so you will get not errors but like different errors so which should be checked outside of the validation engine and for example we see that the name of this effect is unique and you run initially this pure validation but then your code for example can go to the database and check that this stuff is unique or you can write your own interpreter let's say for only one of attributes so that's how you can extend uh, uh, then schema with additional rules and you can invent your own uh, data DSL. Let's say here only one will, will be the vector of uh, attributes here. Uh, or you can invent something more complicated up to some expression. Uh, and you can easily create an interpreter uh, by, uh, even if it's stateful, by interpreting effects. So it's usually done like this. So you go through the effects and uh, it has all information to generate error if something wrong, or you're just throwing it away. Uh, another interesting feature we introduced, it's called light, late binding. 
So I can, let's say I'm writing the library and, and I want, so the people uh, in their user space will hook into this library and configure something inside. So, and, and it works like declare in, in, uh, in closure. So you may say that I have a server which is ref which refers some config model, but this model does not exist. It's uh, tagged as a binding. So let's evaluate this. So and if we read it now, so it, it just empty model, so it, it doesn't work. But eventually, the in user space, uh, a user will require your library, and it will be able to uh, bind the config. Uh, to this symbol in the library. So this may simplify the configuration. So you can only expose the pieces uh, of your framework or library which should be configured and reduce the boilerplate. Because initially we were thinking that all the users will write then schema straightforward, but sometimes uh, they only want to write a few configurations. And uh, so that we introduce the slate binding. And if you now try to read the config, it will be resolved uh, to the user binding. So they, there's some small indirection. And then if it's binding, it, it will try. As well, you will get the warnings if you load the project and no uh, and bindings uh, and something which were defined as a binding were not uh, resolved, yes? Okay, probably too abstract, yeah. <laughs> so that's, and uh, let's come closer to the what system will look like. So the components are sucks. I, when I'm looking at the mount and all this stuff and components, so uh, it, it looks like step back into the object-oriented world. You're getting all this object with a local state with a dependencies between these components and you start playing the same game we try to escape <laughs> you need all this stuff and uh, so the general idea was uh, and uh, why not to think the system is just a set of functions let's call it operation yeah yeah they stateful but they are functions there is no notion of the component there may be some notion of the protocol but there is no component, there is no life cycle. There is some central state where, and all of this operation may go to this state and take, let's say, connection or something like this and do what they want. They can call each other and they always uh, can look up through the model uh, graph. And that's why, uh, let's get back, when we are talking about uh, then design, uh, then design. So this context is an atom. It's not a map. It's not a context map, because eventually you will, you will, your system will need some dynamic behavior, like loading uh, models on fly or reconnecting or something like this. So, and I think the good design for the system that uh, you have only one atom, which keeps all the application state. And then you, you have a, a functions, uh, which we call operations, which are getting this state, system state atom. They getting the config from then, uh, and they're getting params. And the whole system can be described this way is just a set of operations, which can uh, access the state in a context. And let's say we're creating the system. Yeah, we defining my application. This is a schema and this is an, uh, okay, this is a operation engine and this is an instance of this operation. So that means there is a multi-method, uh, which is called my application create, which will handle all the instances and instances will be passed at this specific configuration. And the whole of your system is just, just a set of uh, operations with the same uh, with the same signature. 
So now uh, let's say, let, let's define this method, create, it will get the configuration and the schema should come from configuration and it will get the user input uh, in params. Probably it's too hard to <laughs> understand, but okay. So now we define it and now we can call this operation by providing the whole state of the system, including all this metadata and the name of the operation. So then we'll go to the uh, metadata uh, database, find this configuration and call this multi-method passing the data. Yes, let's enable the logging. Okay, and we see, so initially it's validated and send us some errors and then it's show us that it was called with the parameters. Yes, you can imagine at, at that moment, it will do like going to the database, or reject if validation errors and stuff like this. But what's nice that all of these operations, because we, we keep the whole system in one atom, atom and it's passed it through the whole system. So each operation can call other operation and uh, potentially each operation know a lot about the whole system. Yeah, that, that's a problem with the component design of the system that eventually almost every component uh, should know about other components. And uh, the more smarter your system becoming, the, uh, the more uh, dynamic configuration you want, yes? So even logging should be configured. The metrics should be configured. Yes, that, that means that potentially any component of your system may need another component of your system. And when, we, when you're trying to do this in an object-oriented way by building these borders of abstraction, uh, you eventually end up that, okay, so I forgot to pass the metrics uh, to, to this stack, yes? And it's where you should refactor everything to pass this. So I think that the evolution of the system is becoming more smarter and more dynamic. The smarter means that eventually your operation may even depend on the load on the system, yes? If the system is uh, uh, under high load, you may don't want to run some workflows, some jobs, yes? So, and all this stuff uh, may happen like, yeah, or, or you can turn off the logging for most of the requests, uh, because of performance problem, yes. But for the trace to trace specific problem, you want to turn on the logging on a specific re only on a specific request. So the rest of the system should work. Otherwise, that's why I think this 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 idea is quite good that all these uh, functions, all these system operations should get the model of the whole system, including the state, at the first parameter in Atom, so potentially it can mutate it. So you may have a uh, operation which will switch your system into, I don't know, logging mode and then switch back. Okay, probably too hard, yeah? Are you still with me? Okay, so um, now, for example, this is a, a just an experiment that how we can model system without components, yes? So let's say we have the systems, system, and uh, the whole system will have an entry point where we describe that the system will start, and this start will call just three operations, which will, let's say, initialize a connection or migrate database, and probably put some state into the setup of the system. So we can show you, yeah. Okay, so we loaded the systems. So we now describe that DB will start by initializing the connection and the stop by closing this connection. And when we call the start system, you see it, it's called the DB start and you can always, or your operations can get into the state of the system. Or you can even introduce an additional layer of indirection. So where this state is stored, may be declared in your model. Yes. So if you have multiple databases, so they get their own names and you can somehow map 
uh, kind of configure your operations uh, with the different databases and stuff like this. But this approach we tested, it's, it's very nice though, because you can uh, um, grow your system by adding more and more operations. You never get in the situation that you forget through your all dependencies graph of components to uh, bring some additional dependency for this uh, component yeah through the stack so potentially it, it it's maybe kind of it's like dynamic programming <laughs> so uh but i think if you want to build a dynamic system if you want to grow the system with the small steps without redesigning it every time so this idea have a central state have a bunch of operation and all the operation getting some model and state of the system as the first argument is a quite nice. Okay, so another topic uh, which is supported by then protocol, but this is uh, like extensions of them. Yes, you can throw away all of these ideas of the operations and start system. So it's just example how the system can be modeled using this metadata you can invent your own so and so but we decided that we want to introduce like uh, uh, publish subscribe functionality so some operation may publish some events and you can always subscribe uh, to this operation um, to specific events and call other operation so that's how you can configure everything so we define that there is a, a on create event the operation create will emit this event. Uh, here you can describe the, the payload of the event. And then we can subscribe uh, operation, specific operation, let's say to Kafka, to this specific event. Here you can, can have a list of events or you can have a, a magic all events, stuff like this. So, for example, we never treat the logging as a printing some strings. So, in, in our system, the logging is a just emitting some structured data. Yeah, as well, the hook system, when you can extend, let's say, you're, you're, you're storing in your primary storage, but you want to replicate everything to Kafka or something like this. Yeah, or you want to collect some metrics or you want to do something like this. So, using this pops up feature, you can decouple this stuff. And using this uh, uh, subscription uh, DSL, you can uh, construct different uh, uh, possible configurations. Okay, so yeah, here is an example. So we, for example, built the uh, engine for HTTP, and here how it's described with them. So we have a system which is entry point it will say that it will run http operation which will start the uh, server and uh, this HT server has a reference to the api which is a dsl uh, for uh, describing routers and here we say if you get hello please call operation hello op which is described here it, it may have other configuration like storage or something like this or schemas to validate so and this stuff is working so zen web like a module on top of zen is published so it, it comes with an interpreter which run web server and it has a routing library uh, in zen and it has a bunch of middleware so a lot of stuff and so you can easily uh, create your web server. Okay, let's run this stuff. So starting, here we start. So we can even take a look at get state. Okay, so yeah, the server is running so let's call this uh, let's call it through the http no oh, sorry it's broken. let's call it just internally okay it's, it's broken 
because we forget to evolve this multi method in a, in a under comment. So now we call can call this operation directly through the system, not through the HTTP stack, or we call it through the library which is routing to this operation, or we call it uh, through the HTTP client outside. So. Okay, so probably, I don't know, two abstracts. Uh, I think that's all from my side and uh, I'm ready to answer your questions. <laughs>